I do the, the keynote speaker. Let's give, let's give her a round of applause, people. She's earned it. She has really earned it. for having me. Um, Mother McCoy, I'm just honored to be here with you. Um, I was complaining when I got here because it took an hour and a half to get here from Los Angeles. And then I saw you were being honored. And um, just the lifetime of work that you've done, Absolutely. it's an honor to be here. I'm thankful that I could drive here and be here with you. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I was sharing with Mr. Thomas that I don't know if you're ready for uh, what I have to say because one of the parts that I think was accidentally left out of my bio is I'm also one of the founding members of Black Lives Matter. Oh, so, um, so I take a very different approach to some of the things that have been said, um, but I think it's important that we, especially as black people, are really transparent about um, the ways in which we can really be free. Right. And so that's the perspective I'm gonna speak from. I pray that the ancestors speak through me, that my words are guided, um, and that I offer something, I contribute something by being here. And I'm also thankful to my children for coming with me yeah. and not complaining about it. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, I, 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 there's a third one at home, so I, I confuse them. Tell me where I'm So, I want to kind of build on what one of our essays talked about, right? Um, the space that we're in right now, right? This space that we're in, I don't think any of us ever imagined that we would move backwards, mm -hmm. right? All of us thought that the struggle for racial justice, the struggle for social justice, the, social, the struggle for economic justice would be an ongoing struggle that would constantly move us forward. But what we saw with the election of Donald Trump on November 9th of last year was the ushering in of something that I have never seen in my lifetime, but my mother and grandmother talked about as being daughters of the segregated South, right? right. We are witnessing an absolutely fascist regime that has come to power, an absolutely unapologetically white supremacist regime that has come to power, and it demands that we're honest about that. We cannot sugarcoat it. We can't pretend like there's any space to build unity with them. I don't want to sit down at the table with Donald Trump. I don't want to be invited to the White House, and none of us should. They are our oppressors. So it's like, you know, trying to meet with the slave master. We ain't trying to do that. We're trying to overthrow that system, okay? Um, so what has he ushered in? This era of blatant white supremacy that's something that we haven't seen since pre-1965, and that exists both in rhetorical and symbolic ways as well as policy measures, right? So we've been focused a lot on the rhetoric of Donald Trump. I think all of us recognize that rhetorically and symbolically, red caps have replaced white sheets. Right? He is invoking his particular ancestors that like to dress up in sheets and hoods, right? And replaced it with the red cap and the words on the red cap. Make America great again. America was never great for us. It was only great for them. What's the again, right? He's absolutely calling upon an old America where black people knew our place, where women knew their place, where, you know, Latinos, um, might come in and work and then go home. You remember those um, migrant farm worker um, policies that used to exist, right? That's what he's calling for. He's calling for the centering of white um, supremacist, patriarchal, heteronormative capitalism, meaning white males who are seemingly straight, rich, and um, uh, able-bodied and have all of the other privileges are the center of the world and everybody else is marginalized. And he's doing that through rhetoric. And we become kind of caught up 
sometimes in the rhetoric, if we turn on the news, if we turn on MSNBC or CNN or any of these cable news shows, we hear story after story of what he's done this week. And those symbols and that rhetoric is impactful, right? We have to absolutely stand up when he calls on our Congress member Wilson and claims that she's a liar when the, the uh, uh, evidence comes out and we find out not only is he a liar, but his chief of staff is also a liar. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah? When he's talking about when it's a black service member who's murdered in Niger, right? He says, well, he knew what he was signing up for and doesn't even bother to learn his name before he calls oh, his yeah. family, oh, yeah. right? right? And so we have to be appalled. We have to be um, absolute. We have to refuse to take those kinds of things. When he goes after Jamil Hill, why does he care about an ESPN report, right? But goes after her job. Right? And says she should be fired and she's taking down ESPN. Right? That's a problem and we have to stand with Jamil Hill. Right? When he goes after Colin Kaepernick, right? And NFL players and says that these boys, these boys, right? Listen to that rhetoric. These boys got to know their place, right? On the field, right? I, I, you can't make this stuff up. They are absolutely field Negroes, right? He has, they are field Negroes and the, the owners, literally, the owners should be able to dictate what they do. And they better stand and pledge allegiance and stand and sing their national anthem. Let's remember we have our own, right? We have our own, right? Um, they better stand and honor that, right? Even when, when we think about why Colin Kaepernick took a knee in the first place, right? It was about the fact that what you say, one is oppressive to me, right? As a black person, right? We know that the um, language of the Star Spangled Banner was meant to celebrate slavery, the chattel slavery of black people, yes. right? But two, even in the first verse, it doesn't match what's actually happening. This is not the land of the free when black people are being killed at least every 28 hours by law enforcement. This is not the land of the free. And so Colin Kaepernick took a knee in order to illuminate that. And for that, he's been fired. He's been, um, let's call it white balled, right? He's been white balled, right? He's been removed from the league and anybody who follows suit, a warning shot has gone out. They're talking about requiring NFL players to actually stand for the white national anthem, right? So this is the rhetorical and symbolic work of white supremacy, right? Um, the rhetorical and symbolic work also gives rise to white supremacist acts of violence. And you all know it all too well out here in the Antelope Valley, right? One of the homes of more white supremacist groups than anywhere else in the country. I'm sure I'm telling y'all because I read it, but y'all know because you live here, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's important that we understand what's happened under Trump. So um, since hate crimes have been, um, we've started keeping statistics on hate crimes, and it's only been since the 1980s that we've kept statistics on hate crimes. We've seen the number of hate crimes decline every single year, right? Um, and they've always gone down. It's not until the end of 2016 that we saw a spike in hate crimes. And in fact, um, the last quarter of 2016, we saw a surge in hate crimes. We saw um, a 15% increase, um, a surge to the degree that there was a 15% increase in the year. But it's because of the last three months in hate crimes in Los Angeles and a 62% increase in hate crimes in Washington, D.C., the uh, city that um, saw the greatest spike in hate crimes. Um, we also saw in the last two weeks before the election, hate crimes go up in New York City by 500%, right? Think about what Donald Trump is saying, right? You all remember those, um, the scene that was, um, it, have you all seen the film 13? Oh, yes. 
If you have not seen it, it's on Netflix. You absolutely must see it. <laughs> Ava DuVernay's film, 13th, which talks about how um, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution has one very important exception to it, which is your, the 13th Amendment, which supposedly freed us from slavery, right? It has one very important exception, um, which is you can legally be enslaved if you are imprisoned, right? Mm -hmm. If you've been duly convicted of a crime, you can be um, enslaved, right? And so what we're seeing with the system of mass incarceration is quite literally the enslavement of mostly black people, right? Mm -hmm. Who are 40% of the jail and prison population. Um, and so it's really important that we understand that. It's also important that we understand that in 13, um, as was cited in 13, we, do you all remember when Trump had that rally in Chicago? Oh, yeah. And um, the guy who was at the rally elbowed the black man walking up the stairs. And then Trump said, that's how we did it in the good old days, right? In the good old days, he'd have had it much worse than that. He'd have been brought out of here on a stretcher. You all remember that? Yeah. So that kind of rhetoric is stuff that we need to be outraged about the rhetoric, but we also need to understand what it spawns, what it encourages among white supremacists, right? Now more than ever, I've never seen people riding through, I live off of Crenshaw. I know y'all live out here, but you know where Crenshaw is, right? I live off of Crenshaw. We have seen trucks drive down Crenshaw with Confederate flags. Am I lying to you? Right, so we haven't seen this level of blatant white supremacy um, before, and it's uh, in large part because of Trump's um, rhetoric and symbolism, right? It actually has outcomes. But beyond the rhetoric and beyond the symbolism, we also need to be aware of what policies are coming forward. So this white supremacy that Trump embodies is not just a matter of how he speaks about Colin Kaepernick or how he disregards the lives of black people or how he disrespects black women leaders especially, right? It's not just a matter of the rhetoric and the symbolism, it's also about policy and it's why we have to not just watch Donald Trump, but the entire Trump regime, right? The entire Trump regime and how he also pulls the Republican Party even further to the right and makes us think that, you know, there are reasonable Republicans, right? Makes us think that, oh, well, Mitch McConnell isn't so bad or Paul Ryan isn't so bad or maybe if we impeach Trump, we'll get Pence in there. He's reasonable, right? Forgetting, forgetting to read Mike Pence's track record, which is actually one of the worst, one of the most fundamentally oppressive track records of any elected official that's currently alive, right? Um, and so we need to remember that the rhetoric, which is sometimes um, explosive, sometimes enraging, sometimes incites violence, is just one piece of it. We have to watch the policy. So when we watch Trump appoint to every single cabinet position, People who stand in direct opposition to what that post is supposed to be about, we can't afford to close our eyes. We have Betsy DeVos leading the Department of Education. Betsy DeVos, who has dedicated her entire career to undoing public education, right? And so what kind of policy work is she now doing? The privatization of public education. How many of y'all are in teachers or work for public school systems? Am I telling the truth? I'm telling the truth, right? We got to watch what's happening, and it's happening super, super fast. So they're not passing legislation through Congress. They're mandating it through the policy work of these cabinet posts, right? We got Steve Mnuchin. And as the Secretary of the Treasury, I don't know if you all know who this man is, but he is single-handedly responsible for, remember the mortgage meltdown? That was his work. That was him. He was one of those people, what do they call them, um, a vulture capitalist, right? He was one of those people who set mostly black and brown people up for mortgages that they could not afford poured all your money into these homes and then lost them, right? 
That was Steve Mnuchin, and he is now the Secretary of Treasury, right? And I could go through every single cabinet post, but I want to um, just stop right here for a minute. We now have, in the Department of Justice, someone whose name should tell it all. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, right? Named after two Confederate soldiers, right? Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, right? Who immediately went to work to undo the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, right? Immediately. We need to think about what kind of policy work comes from these people. We need to think about what Jeff Sessions said in September about um, claiming a new war on drugs, right? We are now gonna engage in a new war on drugs. Quoting my, one of my favorite rappers, T.I., right? A war on drugs ain't nothing but a war on us, right? That's what a war on drugs is. We need to remember what happened with the war on drugs, right? The war on drugs, first coined, the term first coined by who? By Nixon, right? Yeah. By Nixon in 1971, meant to assault black communities. Let's be real clear, right? The assault was on black communities then picked up by Ronald Reagan and run with, right? And so this is where we, we had these disparities in sentencing. We had um, uh, sentences for crack cocaine that were a hundred times what the sentence for the same amount of powder cocaine would be. Even though to get to crack cocaine, you gotta have the powder first, right? But you were locking up, they were locking up our folks. And not just for a little bit of time, there were these mandatory minimum sentences, right? This is what um, the work of uh, Barack Obama, the work of um, Eric Holder was about at the end of Obama's second term. What he tried to do is remedy some of that by releasing, um, giving clemency to 1,900 folks who had been imprisoned for extraordinarily long periods of time. And it sounds like something that's um, just theoretical and disconnected from who we are, but I knew three of those people who were released, right? I grew up with Little Dale, and he got out as a result of that clemency. Freeway Rick Ross, who you all know from Los Angeles, right? Who was set up by, you know, you can, um, research some of the work that Maxine Waters did, um, which shines a light on how the CIA actually was responsible for bringing crack cocaine into South Los Angeles, and Rick Ross was used, the real Rick Ross, right, um, was used as really a tool for foreign wars. He had no idea what he was doing, right? Um, and then there's sisters who were also locked up as a result of these uh, mandatory sentencing laws, right? Um, Shauna Berry Scott, um, was released as a result of this clemency um, that Barack Obama granted at the end of his term. So what is the Trump regime doing? What is Jefferson Beauregard Sessions doing? He's taking that away. He's invoking, again, talking about things like mandatory minimums. Here in the uh, Antelope Valley, I know that you all have um, uh, an, uh, DOJ oversight of your sheriffs, right? One of the things he's also doing is saying there will be no more of those. We don't need to do that anymore, right? Um, and we can think about Holder, the Ferguson report, and the other things that had come out, really kind of trying to shine somewhat of a light on corruption, brutality, and killings at the hands of the police. And Sessions says, no, that's no longer an issue. What we're gonna do instead is give um, police departments more resources to keep communities in check. So instead of saying we're going to keep the police in check, we are going to arm police as if they are um, military forces. We're going to give them military grade weaponry mm -hmm. to patrol black communities. You don't believe me? Look it up, right? Look it up. And so this is what we're looking at. Um, these are the kinds of policies that we're looking at. We're looking at a new Muslim ban. And I know sometimes black folks, we think, Muslim man, well, my name is Abdullah, I can't say that I don't care about a Muslim man, but black Christians, right, sometimes think Muslim bans don't apply to us as black people. It's really important that we understand Muslim is also code for black in this country, right? One third of Muslims, American Muslims, are black people, 
right? One third of American Muslims are black people, the highest number, right? We are the plurality of the American Muslim community, right? And so when they say Muslim ban, they're really talking about black people. There's data that shows um, you think that uh, the, all these policies that came out, you know, the take your shoes off policies at airports and all of that stuff, you think that's not meant to target you? All the data that's come out on the new policies at airports since September 11th, right, show that the people who were targeted the most are black women. Right? Black women are searched more than any other group as a result of these new kind of counterterrorism measures. Right? We also need to think about, um, there's a new study that comes out that just came out, I think it was Friday, that looks at the treatment of prisoners. And it looks at abuses that prisoners endure and who's most oppressed in prison. It's black Muslims in prison, right? And so when we talk about a Muslim ban and the targeting of Muslims, we also need to recognize that those Muslims are black people, right? Um, and then finally, in terms of policy, what I just want to point to is, um, have you, did you all hear about this new um, category for um, possible threat um, that the Sessions administration that the Trump administration yes. has ushered in. I already know what you're talking about. Black identity extremists. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. What is that? <laughs> what is that? Let me tell you. I had read the um, foreign policy um, article on it, and I kind of understood it. And then in preparation for today, I said, let me read the actual DOJ report, the actual FBI report. It's an FBI report. And so I read the FBI report. And they say that in the last four years, there have been six attacks on police. Now, they try to make you think. I know that you all are trained to believe, we're all trained to believe that being a police officer is a really dangerous job, right? Let me say that that is not true. That it, and I know it sounds counterintuitive, but read the data for yourself. It's not even one of the top 15 most dangerous jobs. Wow. It's much more dangerous wow. to be a cab driver. Wow. Much more dangerous to be a cab driver, more dangerous to be a meat packer, more dangerous to be a construction worker, wow. right? It's not even in the top 15, oh my right? So think about what they're saying. Over the last four years, there were six black identity extremist attacks, not killings, right, on police officers by what they call black identity extremists. So I was like, well, what is a black identity extremist? <laughs> a black identity extremist is anybody who feels like they need to have solidarity in the black community. Now look around. <laughs> look at the title of today's event. Guess who's a black identity extremist? All of y'all, right? All of y'all, right? You celebrate Kwanzaa, guess what, you a black identity extremist. You take a black studies class, black identity extremist. You got an African name or an African sounding name, black identity extremist. Look what else is in there. If you were upset about the killing of Mike Brown and Ferguson, you are a black identity extremist. Oh my God. Now I'm saying this and I'm going to ask you now, anyone who is not a black identity extremist by that definition stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nobody standing, right? That's all of us. And we're saying that it's important that we understand these policies because this is not the first time that this has happened, right? When we think about the struggle for civil rights, right? What did they call Martin Luther King, right? We celebrate him now. They want to yeah. celebrate him now. They want to throw it in the faces of Black Lives Matter organizers saying, Martin Luther King would be upset at y'all for shutting down freeways like Martin Luther King ain't shut down the no. end of <laughs> right? Right? So we need to understand that this is not something new. They have always, always, always tried to quell black dissent because they know that when we stand up, we win. When we stand up, we win. Every single time we win. So this moment, I want us to understand this moment, but I also want us to understand the opportunity 
that we have in this moment. I want us to understand the, the weight of this moment. I want us to understand that this is no joke, that we are moving backwards, right? There was a, um, now I'm dating myself. I always tell my kids I'm 29, okay. right? <laughs> But there was a sister soldier. Um, I remember sister soldier. Yeah. Slavery's back in effect, right? It sounded like fiction then, right? I'm just saying we moving backwards, y'all. We moving backwards, right? And we have to understand the severity of that. What it means that they're locking our folks up um, with increased frequency. What it means that did you all see what happened to the stock market? on um, private prisons the moment that Trump won that election, soared, went through the roof. Why? Because every single bed is going to be filled with our people. They know it's a cash cow, right? This is a cash cow. They're about to be locking people up and throwing away the key, right? Same thing when you think about what's happening with privatized education, right? They are talking about how you make the most money possible off the backs of our babies, right? So we are moving backwards. We are moving backwards, and we have to understand that. But that doesn't mean we have to submit to it, right? Yeah. We don't have to submit to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some would say when we look at what's happening that the system is failing us, I want to say that the system is not failing us. The system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, right? Um, in, in the words of one of your leaders, W.E.B. Du Bois, a system cannot fail those who it was never meant to protect. A system cannot fail those who it was never meant to protect, right? So the system was designed to produce these outcomes. So rather than trying to fix the system, we have to remember the words of another great leader, Henry Highland Garnett, another abolitionist, another um, a forerunner to liberation theology who invoked God, right, in his demand for freedom, right? He said that if we submit to unjust systems, we are sinning against God. God demands that we be free, right? So if there is an unjust system, he says, let our motto be, Resistance, resistance, resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance, right? So we have to resist this system that was never designed for us, uh, right? We have to, in order to resist it, we have to unify, we have to come together and say, what is it that we want? What is it that we refuse? How do we stand together in making those demands? And then beyond resistance, we have to vision together, y'all, okay. right? I think everyone in here agrees that we should not have a system of policing that kills black people every 28 hours. Am I right? Right. right. And that system that kills black people every 28 hours, did you all know that in Los Angeles County, under the watch of our district attorney, Jackie Lacey, in less than five years, 300 people have been killed by police? Did you know that number? Do you know how many of those officers who've killed our people have been prosecuted? None. Not a single one. So not only do we have a system of policing that sees us with targets on our backs, but the police kill us with impunity. There are absolutely no repercussions for the murder of our children, of our mothers, of our brothers, of our fathers, of our sisters, we need to remember that the people who are killed by police are our family members. Mm -hmm. They're people who deserve their lives, mm -hmm. right? One third of them struggle with mental health issues. So then why are we not deploying mental health teams rather than police with guns blazing, right? Mm -hmm. J.R. Thomas in um, Pasadena called the police because he, father of nine children, felt that he was having, he knew he was bipolar, he was having a mental health break. He picked up the phone and called 911 himself and said, I feel like I'm having a mental health break, can someone come help me? What do the police do? Burst into his apartment and beat him to death with a fire extinguisher in front of his children and his pregnant wife, right? And so, and this is just last year, this ain't something that happened a 
long time ago, right? This is something that's happening every day. So I think we all agree that that system is unjust. I think we can agree. I know that you're in a different school district, but my children go to public schools in LAUSD. LAUSD has a mandatory so-called random search policy which means that every single day at every single high school in LAUSD, children are pulled out of class. My daughter was pulled out of class last year and physically searched for contraband. What do you oh think is contraband? God. What do you think, I, I think, drugs. contraband would be guns and drugs. What were they looking for, Tyvee, what? Sharpies, whiteout, hand sanitizer. Lotion. Sharpies, whiteout, hand sanitizer, highlighters, lotion. Asthma inhalers. I call those things school supplies, right? I bought the highlighters. How about that, right? They were on the list of things that she should have, but if she gets caught with them, that's contraband, right? So I think we can all agree that that system is an unjust system. We should not have so-called random searches of children in schools. They are students, they are not suspects, yes? We can agree that we have to resist unjust systems, but then we also have to do something that's a little more difficult. So I'm gonna be completely transparent with you. Black Lives Matter is a police abolitionist, a prison abolitionist organization. I don't believe in police reform. I think we don't need police as they exist anymore. We don't need to lock people up in cages anymore. It doesn't mean that we don't have a system of public safety, though, right? And so what does it mean when we say, and I could go into it further, but what does it mean when I say I'm a police abolitionist? It means that I understand that the system of policing in this United States evolves from slave catching, right? That police in this country were, their previous incarnation was as patty rollers who literally saw targets on the backs of our people, right? And I don't believe you can reform a system like that. I believe you have to dismantle that system and build something better. Right? And so how do we step back and say, we believe that policing that kills black people every 28 hours and that uh, refuses to hold the police who do it accountable, right? Um, we believe that that's not the system we want. Well, what system do we want, right? And so we have to struggle with that together. We have to vision what freedom looks like. What does a system of public safety look like? What does a just educational system look like? Right? What does it mean? Okay, so we don't want random searches in schools, but what else do we want in schools? What, we, what would we like to see happen? Right? How do we vision for freedom together? I see that uh, Mother McCoy left, but I thought it was really important what she said about Medicare. Right? When we think about our health care system in this country, we're always tied to what is. It's only now right, that we have the freedom because this fool is doing some crazy stuff and getting rid of Obamacare and saying, you know, if you don't have no money, you just got to die, right? <laughs> but it gives us an opportunity to say, but what do we really want? If we could have anything, what do we really want? So we have people like Bernie Sanders, I know you know, but we also have black Congress members like John Conyers, who every year for the last, I believe it was 15 years, that he began talking about Medicare for all. So not just for 65 and up, but for every single one of us, because when you are born into the world as a human being, you have a fundamental right to health care, right? Mm. And so how do we begin to vision and build for these things? And I know it's a big thing to do, but it's something that this moment, when they're going backwards, we need to think about what does our forward look like? And sometimes it seems daunting, but I want us to invoke the names of our ancestors. I want us to think about how black people never voluntarily submitted to our own oppression, right? When they told us we were slaves, we said, no, we ain't, right? We said, we are free people. You might have me in chains, but that's not where I am, right? When we think about Mama Harriet Tubman, right, who said that God was literally speaking to her, right? Now we try to act like it's crazy to talk about spirit and talk about God, right? Let's not do that publicly. We only do that in church, right? We need to invoke all of our tools, y'all, right? We need, to, we need to remember 
that the reason Mama Harriet Tubman never lost a passenger on the Underground Railroad is because she said God was guiding her steps, right? God told her when to stop and rest and when to move. God told her when to get in the water. Right, God told her the direction to take, right? We need to remember that. We need to remember that Mama Ida B. Wells, one of the leaders of the anti-lynching movement, right? She began as a teacher in the church, right? And so when she was doing work saying, you know, black people need to leave the South, black people need to arm themselves. I know that's not popular these days, right? Yeah. But you know, Du Bois said that too, right? I don't know if you know that, right? But when she said all of that, she was moving based on spirit, right? We need to remember that she was moving based on spirit. And what we saw was the end to mass lynching right, during the late 19th and early 20th century as a result of her work and the work of the black club women who were grounded in the church and in prayer, right? We need to remember that when we think about the civil rights movement, where were civil rights meetings, civil rights uh, movement meetings held? Church. In the church, in the church, right? There was always prayer before an action, right? We have to invoke all of our tools. And we need to remember that every single movement that we've ever engaged in, anti-slavery, anti-lynching, civil rights, black power, all of these movements we have won. We have won. Harriet Tubman didn't know what freedom would look like, but she knew not to just demand that the plantation be a little bit freer, right? She said, we gonna get to real freedom, right? And we need to understand that that's the moment that we have, that's the moment that we have to seize right now, and it's by coming together, by resisting together, by visioning together, by building together, and by doing work together that we will get free. We gotta remember that when we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Say it with me, y'all. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Thank you. Thank you.